Hi everyone, long time no see. In my previous video, I know I mentioned that like I'd be back into making videos again soon, but that was like a month ago. So obviously that didn't happen. I don't know what I was thinking because April was when all of my final projects were due and a lot of the things I was doing this semester were semester long projects. So I had a significant amount of work preparing these projects to be completed and turned in. And I am officially done with classes, but I do have one project left that is due at the end of this week. So I can't fully dive back in and commit yet, but I would really love to be participating in booktube again. And honestly, just reading at all because my reading has really slowed down. I just have not had the brain space to devote time to reading. And it, usually it's a comfortable escape, but it just, I have not had the energy to read or to really think critically about books or participate in the bookish community at all. So I apologize for that. I don't think there's anything that can be done because I, school, of course, is obviously a priority. Um, so I did not get around to making a March wrap up and I figured I would just do a combo March, April wrap up because I didn't read that much in April. Also, I have some reviews for a couple of books that I'm gonna mention that I read in March and I filmed a review probably about a month ago and never edited it. So I'll probably get around to putting that up because reviews are pretty evergreen. So without any further ado, let's just get on to the books. The first one that I want to talk about was sadly not on the Women's Prize shortlist that was recently announced, and that is Ghost Wall by Sarah Moss, which I read back when I thought I would have time and energy to think critically about the Women's Prize long list. I got to a couple of the books that you'll see here, but not very many. Um, and this is by far the favorite of the ones that I did end up getting to. I really loved The Tidal Zone. It was one of my favorite books of that year, but I found Night Waking to actually be kind of a letdown. So I really enjoy her writing, but I don't feel like I had unrealistic expectations going into this book. And honestly, my expectations were a little bit low because I knew so little about this book and it's quite short. And it is one that I actually read in one sitting. Obviously my memory isn't super fresh because I read this at the beginning of March, but it is the story of a family and the father is quite obsessed with the Bronze Age and survivalism. And so he assigns up his family, his wife and his daughter to join a university research group that is trying to attempt to live like they lived during the bronze era. So they wear like burlap sacks and they have to forage for food and they don't get to stay in you know adequate shelter and it's a miserable experience. And you're really looking at this experience through the lens of the teenage daughter who's being forced along with this. And more than anything, it just is a, a meditation for me on toxic masculinity and women's agency and how easily those things can be stripped away. I don't wanna to say too much without like giving spoilers or specifics, but that is essentially what this book is about to me. And I thought it was very impressive. I found myself on the edge of my seat during the climactic moments and I didn't really know what was gonna happen and I was really worried. And I think that is indicative of how successful Sarah Moss was in her writing and her crafting of these characters in such a small space because I actually was really invested in the outcome. Overall, I think it was quite successful. I wish I remembered more specifics about it, but I, it was one that I annotated a little bit while I was reading it. And I do think it's definitely worth a read and a great introductory point for Sarah Moss if you've yet to try any of her other stuff. In March, which feels so long ago, I can't believe this was just March, uh, I finished How Long Till Black Future Month by N.K. Jemisin. This is a book that I got in my Strand book hookup box. So it's a signed first edition copy. And I was so excited to get this because I really, really enjoyed Jemisin's Broken Earth trilogy. And I haven't read anything else by her. So I've been wanting to read more stuff by her ever since. And this is definitely a mixed bag of N.K. Jemisin. Some of the stories are more realistic. Some of them are definitely much more heavy sci-fi fantasy. My favorite story in this collection was definitely The City Born Great, which is, I think, one of Jemison's most well-known stories and is one that I think has won awards. So if you're looking for any story to read out of this collection, I think that you can find that one online or in other anthologies. But also I think it's worth noting that the introduction to this collection is really fantastic. Um, Jemison really interrogates why she writes short fiction and the struggle and the, the criticism that she faces, especially when writing short fiction. And in general, I thought it was a really great intro. It made me really excited to read the rest of the collection. Did I love every story? No, but I think it's 
it was interesting to see stories from so many different points in her career. And I can tell having read her most recent work, being the Broken Earth series, that um, she's grown so much as a writer. And it made me all the more excited to read more of what she comes out with next, because I think she has grown a lot and will continue to grow. So yeah, I overall thought that this was enjoyable, but I didn't completely love it like I had hoped I would. Also, it's worth briefly mentioning that my partner and I finished Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire in March. I'm not really gonna talk about it here. It remains, I think, my favorite Harry Potter book, but in my rereads of the past five years or so, I never get past book five. So who knows, it might be usurped, but hopefully we'll continue trucking along in our reread of that series together. We haven't started book five yet, but um, maybe after summertime we'll be able to. I don't know, it's Harry Potter. I really like Harry Potter. It's comforting, it's fun. There's nothing else to say. Next, I want to briefly talk about Sympathy by Olivia Sujic. This is one of the books that I mentioned before that I have filmed a review video for. I talk about it in tandem with the book I'm gonna talk about later. So I don't wanna to speak too much on it here because I think I dive much more deeply into my thoughts and they were much fresher than at the time that I filmed that video. This is a modern story of obsession and how social media can play a role in obsession, but not in a thriller kind of way. It's blurred on here as being like the first great Instagram novel. And I feel like that's kind of almost dismissive of what this book is because it isn't just an Instagram novel. And I think that like the connotations carried in that phrase would put a lot of people off of this because it's not just like superficial millennial angst. I think that there is a lot of depth and um, emotional intensity in this novel that I could really connect to, even though I felt like the protagonist was making a lot of really terrible misguided decisions. I thought the characterization was extremely strong. And um, overall, I think it's very underrated because I only know of one other person who's read this book and it has extremely low ratings on Goodreads. Uh, this was actually a book I read because it was one of the lowest rated books on my Goodreads TBR. And that's what made me, that's what drew me to it, is I wanted to challenge that and see if it was wrong. And I think that it definitely was. Um, and I think that perhaps the marketing of it being a millennial novel and an Instagram novel will mischaracterize it. So it gets into the wrong audience's hands and people are put off by it because it's not as superficial or light and airy as you might expect an Instagram novel to be. I don't even know what that means, an Instagram novel. Like, social media does play a role in this novel, but it's not like it's about Instagram. I think it's mismarketed and I would highly recommend it. Um, and I'm gonna hopefully edit that review soon so you can hear more of my thoughts. But overall, I thought it was quite impressive. A book that I was less impressed by and honestly don't remember that much about is If Then by Kate Hope Day, which I read because it was a new release. I listened to it on audiobook. This is a novel in which a several different members of a neighborhood all start seeing flashes. For instance, one of the main characters, her mother has recently passed away, but she's getting flashes of her mother being up and alive and she's not really understanding what she's seeing at first. And there's another protagonist who's recently had a baby and she keeps seeing flashes of herself with a different baby. And it's much more about I think the, their responses to those visions, but there's a lot of other stuff going on. There's a lot of um, relationship angst and there's, but there's also like a disaster side of this. The husband of one of the main characters starts getting major survivalist anxiety and he starts like researching ways to protect his family from natural disasters. And that consumes, I think, an unnecessary amount of the story. And so I ultimately, I feel like my my talking about this book is kind of all over the place because this book was kind of all over the place and I don't know how to talk about it as one cohesive narrative because I don't feel like the book itself was that cohesive. It felt very much to me like a first novel, like it was struggling to find its footing and find its voice and it was pulled in a lot of different directions. And it seemed like it had multiple premises that the author was perhaps too attached to in the drafting of this novel. She wanted to include all these different layers and all these different components. And I don't feel like that they really played nicely with each other in a way that felt cohesive to me. So maybe tighter editing or just like whittling down some of these ideas or eliminating a couple of characters would have made this novel feel a lot more well put together. And I might have gotten more of a point of it, but like so little of this novel has stayed with me that I just don't feel much of anything toward it. Um, I don't feel positively or negatively. I gave it a three stars. Um, and I feel like this is definitely indicative of like a three star novel where it was fine. There's nothing fundamentally wrong with it. I wasn't mad at it, but I do not really remember it either. So kind of falls in the middle. Partner and I over spring break in March, we drove to and from Pittsburgh. And while we were doing that, we listened to The House of Names by Colm Toy Bean. And I listened to it at the recommendation of Matthew Sharapa, which was seconded by my mom, who also really enjoyed the novel. And 
I don't think this is a book I would have necessarily really enjoyed had I read the book physically, but as an audiobook, it was a fantastic experience. Particularly the first narrator. This is a novel that has three character perspectives, and the first one was so beautifully done. The narrator's name was Juliet Stevenson and she just has such a way of performing the text that I found entirely impressive and made me like very endeared to the character in an interesting way. This is the story uh, that begins with the catalyzing moment of Agamemnon sacrificing his daughter to the gods in order to win the Trojan War. And it's not about Agamemnon, but, but rather it's about his family, um, his wife and his remaining children, his son and daughter, their response to that event and how it kind of changes the course of history and begins with Clintonestra, Agamemnon's wife, horrifically grieved by the loss of her daughter and her inability to prevent this from happening. Um, and the way that her grief turns into a uh, thirst for revenge. But she's written in such a way that you really, really get into her grief and her anger and her resentment. Um, the writing is absolutely stunning. I would love to read more by this author because I think that it was so well written. Problems with this novel are mostly in the pacing, which I felt like was pretty inconsistent. It caught me off guard a little bit as a listener and I was never, I was often not sure how long time had passed and it turns out a lot of time was passing and that wasn't immediately apparent to me in the reading of the text. I also found the novel to end at a really abrupt point and I would love to know what happened after that. It didn't feel necessarily where the story came to like a natural satisfying ending and perhaps that was intentional. I mean, just based on like the way that these, these myths kind of overlap with one another um, and kind of build off of one another, perhaps it was intentional to kind of make a statement about how um, there is no one unified narrative. I'm not very familiar with Greek mythology, so perhaps, so that's my best guess at the meaning or intention behind that. I thought it was interesting to read in the midst of all of these other Greek myth retellings coming to the fore with Circe and the silence of the girls. And I think this was just a very like different perspective. A book that I thought was not so great was The Pisces by Melissa Broder, which is the other book that I talked about in my review in tandem with sympathy and the thesis of that review once i get it up is that sympathy is much a much stronger novel and is is much more successful in what it's trying to do than the pisces because i don't think that their intents are all that dissimilar but the pisces to me was just a mess and i did not enjoy the experience of listening to that book at all and it had nothing to do with the gratuitous sex that's not where I take issue with this book, but rather I just thought that the protagonist was wildly inconsistent and I never had a grasp on her as a person because she changed her mind and made these like very definitive statements about herself so often that I had no sense of who she was or what she actually wanted. Um, and I don't think she knew either. And maybe that was part of the intention, but I just never felt like I knew her as a person and she could have said or done literally anything and justified it. And it wouldn't have really knocked the story off its course because it was so preposterous in so many other ways. When it gets to the point where like a character can say or do anything and it won't feel out of character, I feel like you have a broken character. So didn't really like it, but probably not for the reasons that you'd think. It was the only other book on the Women's Prize long list that I read. So I did a really bad job in choosing since neither of the books I read on, from the long list ended up on the short list, but it was still, you know, fun to try. Those are all the things I read in March. In April, I only managed to read three things and two of them were really short. Let's talk about the longest one first. This is a book that I actually started for March of the Mammoths, but I was a fool and that I started this book well into March and was very busy. So there was no way I could have read it in just March alone. And it is The Priory of the Orange Tree by Samantha Shannon. This is a standalone epic fantasy novel. Really difficult to talk about what this is about because it has so many different characters. Essentially the world is divided not only geographically, but, but also by their relationship to dragons. Um, some societies are completely against dragons, think all dragons are bad, and other societies think that some dragons are bad and some dragons are good. A lot of the tension of this novel does come from like differing opinions on the presence of dragons and their power, but I think that it's handled in a really interesting and complex nuanced way because it also ties into their religious values and there are several different established religions that were all very well defined, I think. I got a really good sense of this world's history. I think all the I think all the cultures were really well developed and easily differentiated from one another. I loved this book, mostly followed women. There were only two men 
that were main characters in this novel, and they both were quite passive. So all of the, the active go-getter, like, leadery types were women. All of the, the protagonists who are women are all very well-defined, and I feel like very different from one another. So it didn't feel like there was just one homogenous female story being told, like I've often seen or heard about in other epic fantasy novels. There are also multiple queer relationships in this book, which is always nice to see as well, um, that they, it's not tokenized. There's a lot to say about this book that I really, really enjoyed. I cared deeply for the characters. I loved when everything kind of came together and you figured out what was really going on. And the climactic moments were really satisfying. I usually don't care for battle scenes, but I was really invested in these ones. So overall, I just was really delighted by this book. I was swept away by it. I really wanted to know what was gonna happen. I was prioritizing this book over other things that were probably more important, but um, had a really great time doing it. Don't regret it at all. It was a long book. It did take me quite a long time to get through, but it felt like such a triumph when I was done. Not only for me, having read a almost 900 page book and the characters and the way that things turned out, it also felt very triumphant and very ultimately satisfying. So I, I really, really enjoyed this book. Is it gonna be like one of my favorite books of all time? Probably not, but it was so fun and escapist and just what I needed at the right time. And I would love to read more epic fantasy. So, so if you have any recommendations for epic fantasy with strong female leads, I would love them because I would love to read more stuff like this very soon. I definitely hit a lull in my audiobook listening after finishing the Pisces was prioritizing podcasts. I had discovered some new podcasts that I was very invested in. So I wanted to listen to something and I wasn't sure what. I'd heard good things about Sadie by Courtney Summers. It seemed appropriate because it's also essentially a fictionalized true crime podcast put into a book. So it seemed like a good fit. You know, the true crime isn't normally my genre, but I was curious to see how they did the fictionalized podcast, especially on a production level because it is an audiobook and I'd heard such good things about the production. I don't exactly agree. I think that some of the actors they chose for the characters didn't do very well. Um, I don't think that they were very uh, convincing in their portrayal of the characters they were meant to be, but I did really appreciate like several leads I thought were pretty good. And I liked the fact that they had um, sound effects in the background, like the ticking of a clock, for instance, in a living room or the clinking of silverware on plates at a diner. I thought that, that was really smart and well done and helped make the book more atmospheric. It was a novel that relied pretty heavily on a gimmick and wouldn't there wouldn't have been a lot of substance there if it didn't rely, if it wasn't relying on the structure of the podcast. I do think it was fun. I thought it was an enjoyable way to spend a couple of days, you know, as fun as a book that has sexual abuse and murder in it that can be. And the last book I'm gonna mention, I'm just gonna mention briefly because it's a sequel and it's a manga, so there's not a whole lot to say, but it's My Brother's Husband, volume two. I've been dying to read this since I read volume one a year and a half ago, um, and I've had this since Christmas. It is the story of a Japanese man and his daughter. In the first volume, one day a burly Canadian man shows up at their door and says, hey, I used to be married to your twin brother um, who had passed away, and I really wanted to like meet his family and learn about his culture. So I came here to meet you and the protagonist is very uncomfortable with homosexuality and um, had a really estranged relationship with his brother, especially because he was gay. He quickly learns to challenge his prejudices and he's very willing to learn and listen and grow. And it's just a very heartwarming story about like love and acceptance. And it's just, it's just a delightful series. This continues on where the first one left off. You could see more of their relationship as a family unit kind of grow and develop. And it's sweet, but not like sickly sweet. Characters just really want to get to know each other and learn from each other. And there's something so genuine and wholesome about it that I really, really loved. And I think that it'd be a great manga for basically anyone to read, whether or not it's a thing that you typically enjoy. So yeah, I have absolutely no complaints about it. It was precious and I loved every minute of it. And I'm sad that there's not more, but I also think that it ended in a perfect place. So yeah, my brother's husband. It's so good. Just get it from your library. Like, it's so great. So that is all I read in March and April. I know it's not a lot, a lot, but hopefully I can get through a lot of books in the summertime. That is my my, my hope. I also really intend on catching up on BookTube over the summer when I hopefully will have a little bit more free time. Um, I say as someone who's going to be doing a full-time internship. For all of you who've stuck around to the end of this video and stuck with me on the channel, despite my very inconsistent schedule, I really appreciate it. 
and I'm glad to be back. So let me know your thoughts on any of the books that I mentioned down in the comments. Recommendations are always welcome as well. And other than that, thank you all so much for watching.